I think karma is a big thing. You know, if yeah. you do good for yourself and for other people and you're legitimately like a good person, like good things will happen to you, you know, and you want to help out other people and it's, you know, uh, but if you're stealing and you're doing crazy shit, I think you're going to go down a bad road, just bad karma and bad juju and bad energy. Yeah. All that energy is not going to be good for your reality of your future. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be uh, not a good look, you know, but if yeah. you're constantly trying to help people out and you're trying to intentionally do good things for yourself and for other people, um, I think the universe listens to that and it, it, it pays back people tenfolds on that. <laughs> Welcome back, friends. Today, I drove four hours all the way down to Milwaukee through a heat advisory warning to meet with a guest that I've been familiar with since I was in high school. So super excited to finally meet this guy. This was, um, I got to say, the most famous skateboarder out of Wisconsin probably ever, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show, Greg Lutzka. Oh, thanks for having me. Super stoked to be here. I've been following you for years and uh, you do some cool stuff, man. Your 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 podcasts are on point, so I'm super stoked to be part of this. Dude, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I forget. I think I followed you probably, yeah, probably two years ago now because we initially talked before your documentary came out. Yeah, uh, the documentary just released today, actually, which is crazy. Yeah. And that's been uh, one heck of a project. To get it on the big platforms like Apple and Amazon is like a whole other project. Like, it's, it's insane to get on those platforms and what it takes, you know, and we had to switch, you know, the music rights out, like, so songs for my video part we couldn't use in the in the documentary that actually went to the public because we just didn't have the rights, you know. So uh, that was a process, and then we did a we did a premiere here too. I think that's when we yeah. were gonna meet. Um, so we did the Milwaukee Film Festival, which was really cool, and um, yeah. So we're here now. Yeah, dude. <laughs> we're able to get on the show. So well, because you cool. moved. I mean, uh, I guess to, to summarize, Greg Lutzka mm -hmm. is from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, and is a pro skateboarder. His documentary called One Way Ticket, which now is on Amazon and a bunch of other platforms, is about his one way ticket flight out to California, where he moved yeah. when he was uh, in high school. And you've still lived in California ever since, right? So that's why it's been hard to get this to line up because you come back for brief visits. Yeah, yeah. Like my family still lives here. I went to Bayview High School. Um, you know, I was super passionate about skateboarding always, like since I was a kid, you know, looking up to Andrew Reynolds, Tom Penny wanting to like move to California to be a pro skateboarder and frontside flip the way, you know, Andrew does. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I wish I took a flight, but I actually drove uh, to California, uh, dropped out of high school, like risked it all. Um, I was just like so driven and like, like we're gonna make this happen. There was no plan B. Uh, I went to Europe, like, you know, and won this like World Cup contest, my first pro contest. I came back with some cash. I forget how much it was, like 30 or 50 grand, I think bought this BMW, like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I had this she like Honda Civic car that my dad bought me for like 1500 bucks or 2,500 bucks back then. Bought a rel super reliable car, BMW, and moved to California basically with uh, two of my good friends, John Bunch at the time and Pat Acuff. And we lived in this one bedroom apartment and uh, it was in Huntington Beach and it was where the, the Warner mob basically lived, yeah. like Andrew Reynolds and these guys. So we skated like a lot of the same spots that those guys skated. This was uh, after they were moved out of there. Yeah, right? they moved up but up to LA, but like okay. you know, I, I remember like moving there and just being like, "Oh my God, that's the spot!" Like Reynolds skates, you know, it was yeah. like three blocks from our house. So I got super psyched on just skating all those kind of spots. Those guys were in the four and one days and yeah. all that kind of cool stuff, um, and lived basically in a one bedroom apartment. Man, like it was, it wasn't nothing fancy. It was like my my mattress, and I'm saying our futon mattress was here, <laughs> bunches was here, and Pat's was here, and it was like we were all living in like basically one room, and then we had a we had a living room, and if like you brought over a chick or whatever, it's like you pull your mattress out to that room, and, like, <laughs> and then like I remember getting like wheels thrown at me and stuff, like <laughs> you know, like we were just like. Oh man, th those are some of the best days of my life. You know, like yeah. we just were, uh, it was like a dream come true to move to California. And um, unfortunately, like after time, like Bunch moved back after like six months, he had a girlfriend here and he ran out of money and he was working at Jamba Juice and we used to call it Jamba Bunch Juice. <laughs> <laughs> so he ran out of money and was like, dude, I'm just gonna move back. My chick's back home. Uh, so, so that soldier's gone, you know? And then Pat, Pat was, um, you know, Pat was there and then he ended up dating, I think it was like Chet Thomas's wife at the time, her sister. So like he was hanging out with her a lot. I was traveling a lot. And then we both kind of just went our own directions. I think he might've moved in with her or something. Sure. Um, and then I ended up buying a condo cause I, I, was, I was literally in like that year, I was filming round three and I went from like this, like sleeping on the couch, I mean, sleeping on the floor, I should say, um, to like getting like bigger sponsors like Volcom and like all these Globe Shoes, like all these sponsors. And um, 
thank God, like I bought my, I bought the condo that I, I'm actually selling now 15 years or whatever, 20 years later. Sure. And I think more than doubled in price, but like I was investing back then without even knowing it, you know right. what I mean? And uh, I think my dad was just like, man, rent is so expensive in California. Like, why don't you, you might want to look at like buying a place, but he didn't know how expensive that was either. Right. So then I went in the penny saver like magazine and started looking like at like con trying to find the cheapest place I could find literally in, in Huntington beach. All I knew was Huntington beach at that time. And went in the penny saver and found this condo for like 300 grand. And the HOA was like 170 where everywhere else was like way higher than that. And the HOAs were like three, 400. Right. So yeah. I barely qualified for my loan. I remember, but I had enough like, uh, proof of income coming in because I had multiple sponsors paying me at the time. Um, and I don't remember, it, they weren't paying me like a crazy amount or anything right. like that, but I was just enough to qualify and I had just enough to throw it on as my down payment. And then my 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 mortgage was similar to what my rent would have been. Oh, sure. So it kind of worked out, you know what I mean? Where, or I could have blew all my money and just at the bars and bought tables and bottles, which Dude, I, which like I did some of, of that too. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot so, of people do though. I have, yeah. I have a question for you. So I'm mm -hmm. kind of in this transitional time frame of like, I told you off mic, I just closed my skate shop, which mm -hmm. is what I did pretty much my whole adult life. Like I opened that when I was 23 yes. and I'm 34 now. So that was like so much of my identity as a person. Yep. But I found after the first five years feeling really limited, like, I want to do more than just this. Like yeah. as cool as it is to own a skate shop, like mm -hmm. I'm still hanging out in the same room every day with the same people talking about the same type of thing. Yeah. And like, I want to grow, yeah. but I found like this weird, I don't know, identity crisis of like, mm -hmm. now I'm not the skate shop owner, but that's like who I am. Yeah. It's like hard to be anything else. And I felt like yeah. I was disappointing people when I wasn't the skate shop owner because I was yeah. doing this other thing. Uh -huh. When you got to a certain point in your career, yeah. you you peak like at your physical skateboarding ability, mm -hmm. you know, at whatever whatever year that was, you win all these contests and eventually you get to a point where you're like, well, you are still a pro skateboarder, but clearly like you don't want to be limited to that. And there's like kind of a window that's ending. Yeah. Did you deal with kind of an identity crisis at that point of like, well, yeah, who am I? Yeah. I, I you know what? I, I really did. I got to a point in my career where, man, I was winning all the biggest contests and, you know, I, I got to a point where uh, I feel like in Paul Rodriguez and all these guys where we were even getting judged against each other, we were getting judged against ourselves. So it was like Paul would do like switch flip back lip down the rails and we, they knew he could do that really good. And right. I was doing like 270 nose ones. They knew I could do that really well. And they were like not like, like I feel like they weren't judging us against each other because they're like, well, Paul can do that easy. Lutzka can do that pretty easy. Like we won't give him as high of a point. So it so. came to a point where like you had to start like doing different tricks and, and that's hard to do because when you're doing new tricks, especially at that, like in the time frames, like, you know, your run, you, you can't really fall. It's, it's, it's crazy now to watch skateboarding like Nigel Houston and some of these guys and, and um, uh, Yuto doing new tricks at that particular like moment. Like yeah. it's, it's insane to me. Uh, we were doing it, but not on the level it is now, but it came to a point where like, yeah, they were like judging against, you know, I felt like they were judging against me. Sure. <laughs> so yeah. I knew when I went out there like to switch it up. And I think when I went Tampa, I did switch flip back, flip down the rail, cab back, flip. I started doing different tricks and getting, noticing I was getting judged higher when I got away from doing the 270 nose blunt, the 270 boards, the front side 360 flip over the hips, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, and, you know, it came to a point where new guys were coming in, Chaz Ortiz, Nigel Houston. Um, I do remember a point where, you know, getting, ex getting invited to X Games and do tours wasn't, as like I barely making it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and then sure. realizing like, man, there's like this whole new generation coming up. And then realizing I was getting older and I did, you know, six years at Monster Energy Drink. And I did another six years at Rockstar Energy Drink because my best friend, Steve Mateus, ended up going and working because he was at Vestel Watches signing with Rockstar and they ended up like, dude, and we always said we we're gonna work together. So like sure. the second my Monster contract was up, I was like, I'm out, I'm gonna work with Mateus because he's my buddy. and like me and him hang, hung out a lot. And then I helped him build that whole team out, bringing on Bastion Salabonzi, Manny Santiago, um, you know, requested certain names to get on that team, Alec Majerus, all these guys. So basically I got to a point where I remember Mateus like saying like, you know, you've been with us for six years. I think I was 29 maybe. I think I was around 29, you know? And I was starting to like not lose sponsors, but kind of lose sponsors. Cause he was like, you know, like, I think we're going to take your pay and we're going to, we're going to spread it apart, apart, like with, with three or four other skaters, you know, cause they were paying me pretty high. But at that time you got to figure like there weren't that many skaters riding for the energy drink companies. Nowadays, right. it's like, if you don't have a drink company, are you a pro skateboarder? Like dude, right. everybody, Jamie Foy, freaking Zion, like 
everybody has a drink deal. So, and those drink deals aren't paying what they used to back then. So that's kind of what he was telling me, like without telling me like, dude, we're gonna go get more athletes, but we're just not gonna be able to pay one or two or three guys a big amount. Right. So I went, and at that time I was kind of switching up my lifestyle from trying to be healthier. And I just knew my body was taking a toll on skateboarding or going out or whatever it was. So I got a water deal. Um, so like, I love drinking water and I work with Aqua Hydrate and Mark Wahlberg's a big investor in that. And I took ownership in that company. So I got shares in that company. And I just became more of like a business kind of minded person after i went and got hypnotized i would say after uh i went i went and got hypnotized by george pratt <laughs> yeah the great dr george pratt if you look him up on youtube like he's been on larry king he's helped out rob beardick tremendously and i was watching videos of rob because he's from the midwest he dropped out of high school he had a skate career and then he got into like doing all this other crazy entrepreneur stuff tv shows like dude, this guy's on a whole nother planet. You know what I'm saying? And he uh, he inspired me to go to George and that that changed my life. And George really like put the mindset, like switched my whole way of thinking. Cause I, I feel like when I was losing those sponsors at that time or not losing, but kind of like, you know, they were kind of yeah, yeah. fizzling away a little bit. I was getting down and like maybe my skate career is over. And the power of the mind and like I'm a big, strong believer especially now like the law of attraction and what you put out there is like what's going to come into your life and what you say and you got to be careful what you say because it does come to reality and and i was just saying negative things man i was like man my skate career is over i had my day you know yeah. what i mean like yeah, yeah. and 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 that's how i felt yeah. and and i was losing deals and i was losing sponsors and i wasn't skating as good and i you know what I mean? And I went to him and it just changed everything. And and he, my mindset switched differently. I used certain techniques that he taught me when I was skating that helped me out, like the light switch, like three swipes up, like boom, you're like ready to go. Like he's like, have you ever seen a basketball player dribble the ball and they go like that to the other guy that's like turning off their lights switch, switch and then goes and dunks. So sure. he's like teaching me like, and and like how, how I use like these tapping strategies and like, you even see like Andrew Reynolds like tapping like three times on the wall. It's like, I don't know, there's just like certain techniques and he just put me in a mindset to really um, expand more than skateboarding, I think, and and basically hypnotized me to like believing that like I was, you know, able to do whatever I want to do in my life and I could be successful at doing this. And you've done this through skateboarding, but now you can do this in other areas. Right. And I got into like the motorcycle business and starting my own website, which is Lutzka's Garage, which we sell a ton of product on, over 45,000 products we carry. and creating other businesses and creating signature pipes with Bassani and Saddleman and all this stuff and then buying real estate and investing into restaurants and like all of a sudden like I just knew in me that like I was gonna just keep building and and, and this this train wasn't gonna stop. Like it instantly changed my life. Like and that happened, I'm 39 now, that happened like 10, 11 years ago. And where I was at that time, even though I was really successful in skateboarding to where I'm at now, I was like, like I, would, I wouldn't even believe that back then if I would've told myself like, no, you're gonna, you're gonna create all these businesses. You're gonna own part of like these restaurants and stuff. Like I'm part owner in four different restaurants in Orange County, and like and and you're gonna own all this real estate and you're gonna build like this next thing that I'm doing, like called the Skate Life, which is like about building community and yeah. inspiring others and come out skateboards and WalMarts and all this crazy stuff, right? right? Creating your own TV show. I would have never believed it, but because he taught me the power and the law of attraction and how I use this this strategy every day in my life, and I live it. Like if you've ever seen this, the movie The Secret. Mm -mm. you should watch it man it's it's real 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 shit man yeah. and if you live by the secret you should really watch it it will change your life and when you think positive and you you attract this stuff into your life it really does come to reality and and i think that's super important to um say this because i know both sides of it when i was thinking negative negative things were happening and when i started like really and you got to figure i was losing sponsors that this, this right. wasn't like at the prime of my career like oh no he was just a pro skater he had this no 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 right. this is on the downfall like of like okay the biggest deals that i had were like weren't paying me anymore you know like um but that's why i'm saying that's yeah. the difficult time is to be able to yeah. shift that mindset of like i did all these things yeah. that i set out to do which losing your identity like, i know what you're saying but you just grow as a person i think you yeah. know like you just grow into it's not like you lost your identity. You just grow into doing other things, like how you grew mm -hmm. into doing podcasts and like inspiring a lot of other people as well, like in life and the stories yeah. that you tell with these amazing people you have on your podcast. And I think for me, like when I do some of these podcasts, like thinking about it now, cause like the Nine Club was the first real podcast or big one I did. Yeah. And, and we talked a bit about skateboarding on there and I think it inspired some people, but I think the more that I get on these podcasts now, I, I wanna like explain certain things to like help out other people um 
you know, I talk about that stuff because I think it is super important that people invest in themselves and, and find out, like I always talk about, like find out what you love to do. You know, if you mm-hmm. love skateboarding was what I love to do, yeah. you know, and, and I figured out every which way I could do, do this and make a living doing this. And people say, oh yeah, he sold out and he went and he rode for, you know, Monster or whatever these companies were back then. Yeah, I got a lot of heat for that. You know what I'm saying? But did they know my upbringing? You know, did they know where I came from, where I didn't come from money or wealth or anything like that? And I didn't have a backup plan. I dropped out of high school. Like I risked it all to move to California to follow my dream. And when the opportunity was given to me, yeah, I was gonna take it. And and luckily I did back then. And I look back and I'm like, man, like I, I think I made some smart moves, especially now seeing all the riders that ride for Dude. Monster and Rockstar yeah. and those brands and yeah. Oakley and, and big corporate companies and, um, Dude, now it was, it was a lot. Mm. It was really stemmed in jealousy, though. Mm. You know what I mean? And I, of course, like you were one of the first people to really branch outside of skateboarding, which yeah. then transfers into you doing entrepreneurship of like, wow, yeah. this world is not limited. You know, yeah. that's one of the things with skateboarding growing yeah. up is you see the top dudes in skateboarding, the top brands and whatever. And like, that's the limited view you see of like what success can be. Yeah. Like, that's the most you'll ever be. Yeah. And once you realize that you can get outside of that, it's like a whole mm. new world. And when with skateboarding, one of the great things is you put all this energy into learning and trying these new things, right? Mm-hmm. Trying new tricks and you, you, you fail and you fail and you fail and you finally succeed and get something and you're like, Oh, I feel accomplished. I'm, I'm growing. Yeah. Well in entrepreneurship, there is that same type of thing though, exactly. right? Because it's you a, make mistakes, you make mistakes, oh, yeah. you see opportunities, you try them. They didn't work like you thought they would. Other oh, yeah. things flow, but there's no limitation on your body now. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I think life is a lot like skateboarding. You fall and you get back yeah. up and that's like the power of like, the mindset of like understanding like you're going to fail, but you can get back up and you can succeed. And the only way you're going to succeed is 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 at times you are gonna fail. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that just builds you to be a, a stronger and like um stronger person and like more um you just learn as you go, have more knowledge under your belt. You know, and I ask a lot of questions. So yeah. like before I do things like like over the years I've I've called Chet so many times for things that I wanted to learn about and and um he's taught me a lot of cool stuff you know so um it's like i didn't drop out of high school because i didn't want to go to school i dropped out of high school because i wanted to be a pro skateboarder as fast as i could be a pro skateboarder i still wanted to learn but i was learning in a different way you know i was Mm -hmm. traveling the world i was learning through people that were older than me that were actually business owners you know so they taught me so i was kind of brought up at 17 already understanding that you know it is important to create an S corp. It is important probably to invest, you know, like yeah. I, even though at times like I was like, well, I made this money. I'll probably keep going out. I'm going to blow it on this dumb car, which, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, sure. or whatever it was. Um, but I was really around people that were giving me good advice. Yeah. You know, and now looking back, I want to be able to be that person to give that next generation like good advice and kind of inspire them of where to go and what they can do. And for them to believe in themselves to do it because that's like the whole thing in life like if you lose the self-belief you kind of lost you know you kind of you're not going to get there yeah so you got to keep your self-belief going and whatever that takes you know to keep that going that's how you become successful at anything you do yeah because um and that's what the hypnotist did for you (laughs) yeah i mean yeah george pratt did a number to me and and a lot of people that i've known that went to him uh, they've they've helped them out a tremendous amount too so for me, it was just, yeah, I, I you know, I, it's weird because the hypnotist wasn't like one of these hypnotists that's just like, ding, 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 you're going to be successful. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it was nothing like that. Like, it's it's really like he, he hypnotized me to work super hard and like focus on the direction I want to go and like go at it with, right. with like 100%, like I'm doing this and there's like just how I, just what you did when you moved to California is what you do now, but you're just 29 and you're going this different direction. You know right. what I mean? So... Um, and now my, like a lot of my focus now, to be honest, like I skate all the time and I love skateboarding and I just skate because I love it. And just like I, I felt when I was a kid and I have all that pressure of like winning contests or filming video parts off my back. Cause I felt like there was, there was a time where like I was filming video parts and it was fun and I was skating contests and it was fun. And then all of a sudden I got to a point where like I had these big deals with these companies and I felt like. I remember Mateus telling me, man, we you just got to get top three on that damn podium, man, because he's right. got a boss and he's got my Rockstar logo, you know, the Rockstar logo on my right. head. He's like, I just got to, you know, Lutzka's got to get top three then because he's got to go with the boss and show his dudes, hey, look at my dudes, you're on top three. So I felt a lot of a lot of pressure to always have to be on that top spot or I was going to lose 
some my yeah. bigger deals. I think you just lose like the joy, right? Because the joy, yeah. it's it's like yeah. you work so hard to get there in the first place and you celebrate and you have that. Yeah. And then you're just disappointed on your in yourself if you don't hit it again rather yeah. than being excited about getting it again. Yeah. And and maybe that was in my head a little bit too, but I did feel like I had to be like on the podium basically to 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 ensure that I was going to get re-signed the next year. Yeah. Because there were and, and when there's a lot of new upcoming skaters coming in the game, I mean, you're like, dude, this is the time. Like, we gotta, I gotta get this. Like, <laughs> There's dude, a reason the I mean, me so and Desenzo, <laughs> me and Ryan Desenzo, we skated the Money Maloof Cup next to each other. Like, that sure. final round before I skated against Dennis, Dennis Buznitz, I looked at Ryan and we're like best buds, you know? Like, we're on the same team together. Like, you know, like, I look, I'm like, I love you, dog. We, we're getting this, though. Let's go. Like, whoever wins, whatever. We're like, brotherly love. But it was like, a, like we both were very determined to, yeah. to, to, like, we both were. Like, let's get this. You know dude, what I mean? The so, fact that dude still jumps off what amazing. he does at this point is mind blowing. I think we should put together a little song playlist of like just the songs from your video parts where people can listen on Spotify because you didn't have music rights so they can't see it on YouTube anymore. Yeah, I know. <laughs> crazy with the music rights. But you know what's crazy about that is we did pay for the music rights. Like Oakley, uh, it was a Rolling Stone song, uh, Under My Thumb. Yeah. And they, they paid for the music rights there. But because we're referencing that video and it's in the documentary and that's going on Apple, it doesn't like, it's like two different projects, I guess. So in the documentary yeah. that's on Apple now, for one, it doesn't okay. have the song, it doesn't have the songs in it because we couldn't get the rights to- What audio is playing then? Well, we we, we put music, or basically music that was cleared. Oh. Cleared music, yeah. So Nick, okay. Nick bought a library of music that you can buy yeah. online, like right. a library. And then we had to like find the closest music that we could that would sound good with the footage. You sure. got to figure though, it's not showing the whole video part. Right. It's yeah. just showing certain parts. So the, the the when you're watching the movie, it looks seamless. Like it's fine. Sure. If you really pay attention to my career and you're like, oh shit, he, yeah, that isn't the almost round three song, the yeah. Jimi Hendrix song, but it still looks good. Like my like the the skating to the songs that he picked. It's still in the same order. We we still reference the movie. We just ultimately couldn't use those songs yeah well you know? i tried to watch your digital part because like i've followed yeah. i have followed your career because you were mm -hmm. the dude from wisconsin right yeah. and you're you said 39 so you're five years older than me yeah so like you were on top of the world when i was growing up like so i followed it all mm -hmm. but i never saw the digital one yeah the digital one came out uh bill weiss we came out bill weiss is who gave me the opportunity to get in digital yeah and dennis martin and basically we came out with that song with uh the ozzy song but back then uh, they were just doing uh, uh, VHS tapes. And maybe DVDs did come out, but it, sure. it wasn't streamed yet on YouTube and, and YouTube flags, that kind of stuff, like right. if you don't have the music rights. Uh, so I think you can find that video part on YouTube, but it might have a different song. It has no my, song. Oh, it has no song. They took the music off. Well, they have the full length video, except when it gets to your part, there's, there's no, no noise at all. No noise. Not even the skateboard. Yeah. It's just like totally. Yeah, because I think yeah. when you upload it to YouTube or something right. like that, it, it'll, it'll probably flag you. Back yeah. then, Bill Weiss, I mean, those dudes just renegade. Like, wh yeah. who do you want to skate to, man? Well, they, I mean, at know. that point, it was like, well, what are you going to do? Send us a cease and desist? Yeah. Like, we're done making copies anyway. So, yeah. you know what I mean? You can yeah. kind of get away with I think, it. But. I think brands like Oakley, they were a little bit like, they're obviously a way bigger company. Right. So they paid for the rights, you know, and they knew that they were selling this DVD everywhere. And it's Oakley. They have to. They get but, sued. But know? digital, like, you know, it's just more of like, you know, like kind of a like super cool, like, like core kind of video like it was yeah. almost like the new 411 you know what i mean yeah and, and those guys were building something cool and i think it got bigger than what maybe bill anticipated maybe or may i don't know but right. you know he was just bringing his friends like apple yard would come in there and mac and anglia and mike hasty and then like i was skating with those guys so bill's like dude you want to part in digital i was like uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> like well, that they would were be like the trans -real videos at the time yeah right? it yeah. was just like the uh, group of dudes that didn't necessarily all ride for the same brand yeah. that you could see in this one video together let's get back yeah. to the the mentorship thing one thing yeah. that was really difficult and i found this actually with myself too mm -hmm. um is growing up here I guess I'm in a different city, but there's not a ton of people around you that are more successful than you in what you want to do. Cause those are the best mm -hmm. people to learn from, right? It's yeah. like, you're most like the five people you spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. So you want to surround yourself with people that are crushing it in whatever zone you want to be more knowledgeable at. If you Correct. skate with people who are better than you at skateboarding, you naturally end up getting better faster in that kind of way. Absolutely. But 
people don't have access to those people here. The yeah. internet's obviously changing things. You learned when you went out there with Chet and with um, a bunch of the other guys there. Ronnie Mullen. Yeah, well, yeah, Ronnie's yeah. definitely one person to learn from. Oh, yeah. um, but you're trying to do something now mm -hmm. where it's accessible for people from anywhere in the world. Yeah. What's going on with that? Yeah, so there's a platform out there called School, S-K-O-O-L.com. And, um, you know, I was looking online, basically, this is how I found School, because they're fairly newer you know in the last two three years and sam ovens who's like the owner of school i reached out to him because i was on youtube and i wanted to build a community of skateboarders and kind of mentor them and show them like the ropes of how i go out and how i've kind of built my relationships with sponsorships what i negotiate how i build my pitch decks like all that kind of stuff um i wanted to get into basically helping out the next generation of skateboarders ultimately you know so um, I started going on Google and, 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 you know, trying to find like what platforms you can build community on. They popped up and I reached out to those guys and, uh, Sam hit me back right away and he, he loved it. He loved what I was doing or the idea I had because, uh, he grew up skateboarding. So he's like in skateboarding, which if you go on his platform, like they only have like one other skateboarder that's built a community on there and it's Mitchie Brusco. And he's teaching about how to do skate tricks, which is really cool. And what I want to teach people how to do is like how to make it um, in the skateboard industry or more business oriented stuff. You know, like how how do you go get sponsors? How do you negotiate those deals? How do you reach out to companies? How do you present yourself? Like, what what does this look like? You know, so it's completely different than from what Mitchie's doing, where he's teaching like how to do actual skate tricks and all that stuff. So, um, you know, I reached out to him. He had he had a good point when I talked to him on the phone, or I mean on the Zoom meeting, I should say, because I do a lot of Zoom meetings. Um, we sat on the call probably for like, I would say like an hour almost, just wrapping out and just, you know, shooting ideas back and forth. And what he said, which was really cool, and I loved what he said was, you know, skateboarders, it's true community. It's true community. You know, when you're a skateboarder, and I knew what he was kind of saying, because he's from overseas, he's from uh, uh, New Zealand. And when I would go overseas, you know, some of these places that I would meet people that maybe don't speak English, um, we would relate through skateboarding. Even though I couldn't speak the same language, we felt connected through skateboarding. And I thought that was so cool. And I thought that was really cool what he said and how he said that. Like, dude, I would it would be an honor to have you build a community of skateboarders that are all like-minded and you could teach them something through our community, you know? So um, I'm gonna meet with him next week when I get back to California and just, you know, go over some ideas because I've never personally built a community. I know I wanna do it and I wanna do it right. And I, I, I wanna make it a free community where um, I'm thinking about calling it right now. I got a logo and everything, which is pretty cool. It's called The Skate Life because that's what it is. It's the skate life, a community of skateboarders, you know? And in there, I want to give away a lot of free information of, of you know, and, and just go on there like once a week and chat with our, I say our community, because it's not my community, our community that we're building uh, with like-minded skateboarders and answer questions that they have and how, you know, you're asking me questions right now. We can do this through Zoom, um, through their platform. And, you know, I can go on a Zoom call with, you know, hundreds of people, 50 people, 20 people, 5,000 people, whatever it is. Yeah. And, and I can help others like succeed to, or give advice, help them to succeed to the goals that they have, whether it's through, you know, simple stuff as, as of, you know, just, just advice, you know, kind of like, and, and through my life experience, Hey, this is what I would do. And going back over the last 20 years about being in the pro or in the, in the skateboard industry, being a pro skateboarder, I've learned a lot. And if there was someone out there um, that was doing this when I was a kid, you know, I would have got there that much quicker. You know, I would have saved a lot of different steps that I learned along the way. Um, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, like, I'm one of those guys that I, and they kind of say it online and it's kind of funny, like, dude, that kid had more sponsors than anybody. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and that's kind of true because, you know, I never gave up because when I lost, like, say like, you know, I, I, I maybe Oakley, you know, they, you know, I rode for them for eight years, but after that, I had another sunglass sponsor. And then after that, I had another one because I felt like that was just a category. Like, okay, cool. Like Oakley, maybe they're not doing the, the, the skateboarding as much and they're going a different direction is ultimately what happened. It wasn't just me getting, leaving the team. It was like all of us basically. There's a reason there was our life and then not a bunch of yeah. them after. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah. So that's kind of what happened there. But I was like, well, that's just one category. It's just the sunglass category. I'll get a new yeah. sunglass sponsor. So I'd reach out to all, what, what are your favorite sunglasses to wear? Von Zipper or whatever it was. And I'd reach out those companies and same thing with footwear, you know? So I rode for Globe and then K-Swiss and then freaking uh, Osiris and then DVS. And you know, like I've had a lot of sponsors over the years cause I never, um, I always felt like I, could, I, I wanted to keep going. 
you know, I feel like some skateboarders feel like they get to a point, which I was getting to, and I got <laughs> re-hypnotized here, sure. uh, that I felt like it was over. Like, you know, I feel like Paul McNall, you know, I love Paul and, and he's an amazing skateboarder and I looked up to him, but I felt like there was a point where like when he lost his Globe deal and Dark Star because they were owned by this com- the same company, when he lost, he's like, oh, it's kind of over, you know, like, and he moved back to Canada and I felt like he could have kept going and kept building, you know, and once you kind of lose that momentum of like, man, maybe it's done. I, I was getting there. I, I know how that feels. It's, it's hard to get out that rut. Um, and maybe that's why I had to go to someone to talk to and who are you going to talk to about this? You know? So I'm like, oh, I'm at, who am I going to talk to? Like one of my friends, like they, you know what I mean? Like, right. so uh, that's why I got inspired by Deer Dick and seeing what Deer Dick did and how his life just went and yeah. who he went to. And that's kind of similar, but different of what I did, you know, with directions I went. Um, but you know, the mentorship is basically showing the kids and the upcoming skaters and the amateur skaters even, you know, I don't even want to say kids because these these could be 22 year old amateurs that are winning contests and they're just like, dude, I, I don't know how to get paid from these sponsors. I don't know how to reach out to them. I don't know how to represent myself. Like I had an agent for eight years. Nowadays you don't need an agent. You can, you're better off actually representing yourself to be honest. And I, rep- I do all my own contracts. I do all my own deals. I've been doing them since 29, 28, I would say. Why so do did, you think it is better though? I mean, uh, obviously because, like they take a cut and everything like that, but. Nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. Because because back then, who cares about the cut, right? What I, what, what back then we didn't have social media, right. right? So if I wanted to ride for Oakley, it wasn't as easy to get a hold of someone at Oakley sure. or at Monster or at wherever. Back then, like you had to know someone within the company. So Todd Hahn was best friends with Dylan Radloff, who was the team manager at Oakley mm. Connection. Boom. Yeah. Todd Hahn was good friends with, you know, that I ended up becoming good friends with, with Steve Mateus, who got me on Rockstar, right? So he had all these connections. He got me on Monster. He was best friends with the guys over at Monster. So he ultimately put those connections together for me. I was performing and skating very well and getting, you know, the top placings and filming the video parts and doing what I love, which is skateboarding, right. following my passion. And he was kind of doing the deals, but I would go in these meetings. I would, I would hear how he makes these pitch decks for me and how he, how he kind of like presents me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I don't like to say pitch because, you know, it's not like, oh, you're not like a pro, like pitching something, but like how he pr- presented me. Ultimately, I learned a lot about how to do this and I got really good at it. And as social media came along, I understood and learned how to reach out to brands because all these brands have social media, basically right. Um, managers, right? So I would reach out to these brands and say, you know, I'm a two times X Games gold medalist, professional skateboarder. I'm a huge fan of your brand. And I would never reach out to just random brands. It's everything that like, I wanna ride for this brand, like true passion. Like not just hitting up random brands to hit up random brands. Like this right. is like, I wanna work with these guys and this is who I wanna work with. So I'd reach out to them and I'd basically say like, hey, look, like do you have any contact that I could reach out to in the marketing or, Basically in the marketing department, because ultimately that's what it is, you know? Right. And, and when you're looking at brands, by the way, in skateboarding in the core market, I didn't really make my money in the core market at it's all. because there's no money in it. No. <laughs> so like I, the, the, the money that I made being a professional skateboarder all through corporate companies. So at that time, you're not really saying team manager to these people, you're saying like, who's in charge of marketing, right. you know, or licensing, you know? Yeah. So I do a lot of licensing stuff now sure. too. So. Um, there's a huge difference between licensing and, and sponsorships, which we're gonna teach that a sure. bit on the platform. But um, that's what I would do. So I'd reach out to them and then I and then I they would give me their contact, their email, right? And then I'd I'd write a rough uh, not a not a, a gnarly huge sure. email, something that they can read that's a paragraph or two that's not overwhelming to them and they're just like, Who is this crazy kid? You know, like yeah. something, you know, simple. And I would build these pitch decks, which I'd still do. And I'm always updating my pitch decks and how I do it. My pitch deck is 16 pages. And it is like, if you don't know like anything about my career, I can run you through this pitch deck in five minutes and you're gonna know everything of what I do and how I explain of how working with you guys, what you guys are gonna get out of this and my passion for the product and why I wanna represent your brand and why I'm reaching out to you and why my passion's with this brand. Right. So I, I set up these Zoom meetings, I run them through a, a, a presentation deck, right? And then I, you know, I, I start small of just kind of saying, look, like I wanna work with you guys. I never throw out the first number. I think that's just really bad business of just, why 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 are you reaching out to a company and then trying to, pit, then trying to basically shove them uh, 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 a bill. Sure, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, right, right. so I always just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm very strategic at how I work with my brands and, and how 
I've done this over the years and I've gotten really good at it is because I show my value of what I wanna do and I share my ideas. And then I also put it in their hands. I say, why don't you take my PDF deck, I'm gonna email it to you, talk it over with your team and let's set up a follow-up Zoom meeting the next the next week basically of how we can ultimately work together. And you guys have a budget that you guys feel would be you know, fair to all work together, you know? Yeah, and sure. I and I do a really good job at that. And that's just one little tiny thing. And and where I build my my pitch decks, I, I, I wanna teach that kind of more in the class. But, um, and, and I just wanna help out that next generation to show how they can present themselves in a very professional way and how they can reach out to these companies and then what to negotiate in these deals, you know? Like, so for instance, like I've had contracts that have contest matchings. Sure. So when I won the 160 grand at the Money Maloof Cup, that was the biggest prize purse I've ever won in my entire life. I had a contest matching from um, K-Swiss with no clause of basically a, like a, a cap. So I got <laughs> double that money that day. Sure. Plus I had a contest matching with Rockstar Energy, right? They had a cap because they were smart and they sponsored other <laughs> skaters. So they, sure. they capped it out at a certain price. But yeah. I was negotiating deals. Um, well, Todd at the time was negotiating those kind of things in those deals, which made it. So if, a, if you're an amateur skateboarder or you're a pro skateboarder and you get first place, you won 20 grand, you can ultimately win 20, 40, 60, maybe 80 grand if you sure. negotiate these things into your contract, right? Um, there's other things that we, we, we have done over the years that, you know, just to make it beneficial, well, you got to work for these deals. Like you got to work for, you got to get first place or you got to get on the cover of the magazine to get the photo incentive or video incentive or things like that. Um, well, ultimately like mm -hmm. people, they want, no one's giving handouts. Like no. you can't just like reach out to a sponsor and expect a handout because you're good at whatever. Like you yeah. have to provide a solution to mm. a problem for them. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. I interviewed Wayne Hoffman. He's like a big illusionist a long time ago. And he taught yeah. me something. I asked him, how did you get on Ellen DeGeneres? Yeah. Cause he like wasn't famous at the time. And he went, dude, he, he reached out. All you have to do <laughs> is get the right person at the right time. Yeah. It was probably somebody just on their phone, on the toilet, like, well, yeah. I got to figure out scheduling and, I happened to email him at that yeah. time and say, this is this is what I do that I could come on the show that yep. will provide you the programming that you need. Yeah. And I would love to do this. And then mm -hmm. it just so happened that because he did that, somebody had dropped out last yeah. second, he made himself he available in. and yeah. boom. But that's how it works with all these sponsorships, yeah. right? Like I think a lot of people don't um, understand how many no's you have to hear, even mm -hmm. from the same brand, even a brand oh, that yeah. does eventually say yes, yep. how many times you hear no from them because mm -hmm. you didn't, didn't contact them at quite the right time. Yeah. You weren't solving the problem or they didn't need the problem solved at that point in time, yeah. but you have to and focus on bringing that value first. And it's not about them saying no. I think if your pitch isn't right or the way you present yourself, it just doesn't make sense to them. So you gotta ultimately restructure how it does make sense for them. And that's a big thing. And I'm doing that with my TV show, right? I have a, I have a TV show with Fuel TV and we filmed season one, right? And I like, people think I made money on the TV show. I didn't make any money on the TV show. I brought, I actually feel TV didn't pay $1 into the TV show. I literally raised all the money from sponsors I work with, Aqua Hydrate, On It, Kicker, because I had passion that I wanted to create a TV show that's called Next Gen. It's about bringing up the next generation of skateboarders to give them the opportunity on a, on a good platform where they can get seen and, and, and make a career for themselves. Right. So, I pitched that to my sponsors, how important that is to help out that next generation. And they believed in me and we didn't have anything, man. This was like a full pilot. This is an idea on a piece of paper uh, to building a pitch deck of like photos I'm taking from the internet. Like it, it's gonna be at this location, like at the, sure. la like the Lake Forest Skate Park. Yeah. You know, we didn't have nothing, dude. Like, yeah. and they're like, all right, man. We're like, we're like, man, all right. Like we believe in you, you know? And we made it a really cool show. And now uh, Fuel TV has expanded and now we're, you know, we're on Sling TV, we're on FUBU TV, we're on, Samsung Plus, we're now on Amazon. Uh, they're talking to some other huge networks. So it's ex I'm, I'm growing with the network basically, but we're having a hard time to raise the money for season two right now. Sure. And some of the sponsors that I had for season one, uh, because when I talked to them last year, it was a different time. It was a little bit earlier in the year. We're, we're in what, September now? We're getting closer to the end of the year. What happened yeah. was they used up all their marketing budget. Mm -hmm. So we essentially don't have some of those sponsors that we had for season one. So I'm scrambling right now because it's my passion to make this happen. So ultimately, like I'm gonna do everything in my power to make it happen and pay everybody. Like I wanna, cause I manage the money, man. I'm like, all right, yeah. I gotta pay Nick this. I gotta get our sound guy this. I wanna bring in pro skaters. I wanna take care of their time. So like I'm willing to, raise the the little the smaller amount of money that we can't that i can't get to the point to even pay myself right for sure. doing this but i'm going to take care of everyone else because i know that i know this would be a really cool show and i know we have something here and maybe for season three i'll start negotiating 
season three in February, you know, yeah, yeah, January, yeah. February, March, instead of like towards the end of the year, because that's the way the companies work. It's not yeah. that they don't want to be part of the next, this season. It's just the timing was off. Yeah. And that was a lot of my fault of not, because I normally know that, but I had a lot of other stuff that was going on. Like I'm trying to get this documentary put on, you know, big platforms and that's a whole nother can of worms that was very difficult to do. Um, and we, we were very blessed for all the filmers and, you know, photographers that have let us use some of their footage and having those interviews from all the other top pros in the industry and Nick who put together an amazing storyline and had to re-edit the film four different times because we didn't sure. have the music rights. And it was just like, oh my gosh, like this thing is insane. Um, but yeah, timing is everything, you know, and I think the, there's so many times that I've got told no, you know, and I think if you reach back out and you figure out why, why is it a no, you know, is it, is it, is it the wrong timing with budget or is it, is the, is the pitch not right? And you're not showing the value of what you're bringing to them. You're asking too much from them, but you're not showing that what you're going to give them in right. return, you know? So if you're too, you know, I always present it as, I'm going to bring value here by doing X, Y, and Z. Right. And this is why it makes sense to work together. And not only am I a pro skateboarder, but I'm also on these major networks. And I do all these different things to present myself as more than just a professional skateboarder. Right. And I've learned that over the years, like you gotta diversify yourself if you wanna work um, with those kind of companies that are actually gonna pay decent money that you can make a living doing. Yeah. You know? Well, and I think you have to swallow your pride and recognize that sometimes you just can't provide the value enough yet. Yeah. And, and that's a that's a lesson to learn as well mm -hmm. of like, okay, is the reason because what I'm doing isn't to the level that you need it to be? Yeah. In which case, what is the level? Yeah. I, what's a number that I need to get? Do I need to reach a certain amount of audience on yes. this thing? And a lot of these things really like are not exclusively skateboarding. Like, I, and I know that you're gonna build a community mm -hmm. around skateboarding. And you yeah. know, like with me growing up skateboarding, owning a skateboard shop, like so much of what I've done is built around skateboarding. But all of these lessons really apply to anybody that creates anything this would apply oh, for yeah. like music artists this oh, would yeah. apply for muralists this would apply for bmx yeah. riders or for people who entertain by juggling anything. yeah literally anything yeah. right like yeah. you are you're talking about marketing yourself yep. to different companies to be able to make whatever whatever your passion is mm -hmm. viable financially yeah and i want to make it a free community you know and then we'll have because i want to bring in people that are like-minded people and then we're going to have an option in there that will have like a master class which I'm calling it a masterclass, but ultimately it's just the next level up of like really get into the nitty gritty of like, dude, if you got questions, I got answers, you know, that I can help you out with to get you that next level. And if you really need that next level of help, I'll do a one-on-one -on -one session with you. That's like, all right, dude, let's sit down for an hour or two hours or whatever it is. And let's get to the point of like, let's get you to where you want to go. And I will give you the advice that I best can just from my personal experience of, getting told no a lot, learning how I pitch to brands because it's a, it's a, it's a craft in itself, you know? Yeah. Um, there's a reason agents and managers make the money that they yeah, do. I would be, to be honest, I would be a really, and I'm not just toot my own horn. I'd be a really, really, really good manager or agent to be able to get that next generation, some big deals, because I understand, um, just through my experience of what works, what doesn't work. I understand licensing, you know? Yeah. Um, and I understand how to how to how to um, kind of present someone in a in a way that it shows value, and you can do this for yourself. You don't need a manager, and that's why I said right. another reason why you don't need another um, a manager, and why it would be smart to do this yourself is because it's it's your career, it's your future, and you need to take a hold of that yourself. No one else is going to work as hard for you other than yourself. Right, yeah. and it's the way that you present yourself is is basically be the reputation that you give off to the company. And when a manager goes in, it could come off wrong, and then the manager just looks like they want to just make their commission, and it, you're like a product. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. And and I I don't like that. Todd didn't really do that with me because I got lucky because Todd was best friends with Dylan Radloff. Todd was best friends with Steve Mateus. Yeah. So they There's were a personal They were buddies. Mm -hmm. Then they met me at the contest. Now I became buddies and then right. got signed. You know what I mean? Sure. So it's a little bit different. Uh, but reaching out to them and showing passion of why you want to work from the brand, they hear it from you yourself, is a million times better than anyone else reaching out to these companies, um, trying to tell them why they should work with right. someone else. You know, their their client or whatever, their athlete. And I thought about maybe I could represent some skaters one day or something, but I don't know if it's in my wheelhouse of doing that. I'd rather teach people how to do it themselves yeah. and represent themselves because I think that's that's the ultimate thing. And then they can control the companies that they want to go after 
and could you know you want to control your future yeah yeah well and i you think I mean? even if you do you know sell yourself short and you sign a contract that you is was not the best idea whatever mm -hmm. then you can learn from those mistakes Ac absolutely you know what i mean and yeah. learning from them is the most important thing mm -hmm. because you always want to look at long term yeah and eventually long term you want to be sustainable by yourself earning mm -hmm. a good living doing what you want to be able to do and you don't want to be completely dependent on somebody else yep. bringing success your way and, and it just feels good you know, like yeah. how you how you like roll away from whatever a kickflip backflip down the ten stair handrail. When you do your own deal, it just feels good, and it's like you you feel like you accomplished something. And and it's not always about the money, because there's a lot of times where I'll negotiate deals and like they won't have the budget to pay anything. But I want to work with the company so bad that I'll come up with ideas that maybe we can work off like some kind of royalty base or something that we can do together to still make this work. If the budget's not there, that's fine. Let's work on this. And I think this will work better. And it makes more sense for the company. It makes sense for me where I can still work with you guys. And maybe when the budget comes around next year, if you see my work ethic and you see that there's value here, then by all means, we can talk at that time and present to me what, what you think is fair. So yeah. I'll always kind of like, I, I've done deals where I've made no money. And you know, a year or two later, I end up making money off the deal because they believed in me. And they're like, dude, this kid works super hard. He loves our product. He promotes the heck out of it. He's very, his communication's on point. You know, that's another thing. You gotta be good on your emails. Uh, communication is everything in, in, in any business, right? Yeah. If you're gonna take your passion and you wanna make a career doing it, you gotta have really good communication and, um, and you gotta show uh, your passion for the brand and you gotta show um, your value to the brand and you gotta know how to present it in a positive, good way where it's relatable and not scare them away with some crazy number you're coming at them with. Yeah. Or it comes off wrong where it's like, whoa, whoa, like this dude, like, I don't know if this vibe is right. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's kind of like meeting someone for the first time. If your vibe's kind of off, they're like, yeah, he was cool, but eh, he's kind of, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like first impressions, everything on those on those Zoom meetings that I set up yeah. because you know, if, they, if the vibe just comes off wrong, it's like they, they just, they're like, we don't see this. You Dude, know what people I mean? like to work with people, cool people. they like. Yes, they do. They <laughs> you do. Know what I yeah. Mean? And yeah. I, I, and I want to work with cool people. Yeah, like totally. if, if that, that same, like if, if I get on a call and the dude's kind of like not that cool and he represents a brand or the marketing agent for, or marketing manager for a brand that I want to work with and he's not that cool. Yeah. It turns me off from wanting to work with that brand. Dude, I have this happen you with podcasting I mean? actually pretty often. Like yeah. you, you'd be, I've almost all of my interviews have just been people I've DM'd. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. I've gotten a hold of like really awesome people like yeah. such as yourself, yeah. but like a lot of people over the years yeah. that would be like, wow, that person responded. Yeah. Like I interviewed Michael Sieben down in Texas. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not crazy long ago. And all I did was DM him. But mm -hmm. I'll tell you this, if I DM them and they refer mm -hmm. me to their manager, mm -hmm. I, that kind of sucks. I don't ever contact yeah, him because yeah. it's just like, a, I know from that get go that we're not going to it's not going to feel yeah. like peers. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to make this person relatable because they clearly like want to have, like I can yeah. tell from just that saying alone, that's like, this is probably just not even a good idea. Yeah. And think about it. Like think about it in the, the opposite way. If I came yeah. to a company with a manager, they're going to be the same way. They're going to mm -hmm. be like, I, I just don't think I'm going to spot. Instead of me coming to them and talking and showing my passion for wanting to work with right. them, they'll be like, I like this kid. He's cool. Like he, yeah. he, he, he really genuinely wants to work with us. He loves our product. Like, Let's give them a shot. You and know? I think you have to be, you have to like be creative and open to what are you gaining from this thing? Because it doesn't yeah. always have to be financially. That's right? what I'm saying. A lot of times, yeah. like I've done, you know, companies that I've really wanted to work with where I took no pay mm -hmm. and I've even done like product deals or, and then I created like signature products with them of, of just getting creative and made some royalties. And then later on it turned into like, whoa, dude, we don't want to lose this guy. He, he like, he's rad to work with. And yeah. you kind of got to show your value as well. You know right. what I mean? And, and, it's just like it's I guess I guess over 20 years of doing this I've I've learned kind of what works and kind of what doesn't work and that's kind of what I want to show to like those upcoming guys or, or people that are interested in this right show them exactly from my experience of what what has worked and what hasn't worked yeah. and then give them the tools to go do what I what I personally do and show them how to do it and then create it in your own way right you don't have to do exactly what I do but take these programs I use, take this idea, sh I'm gonna show you exactly what my pitch deck looks like. I'm gonna show you exactly what I negotiate. I wanna see the I'm pitch gonna, deck. I'm gonna, yeah, it's great. <laughs> and I'm gonna show you how I reach out to brands. I'm gonna yeah. show you how I negotiate things. I'm gonna teach you about this and then take it in your direction. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no right or wrong to anything in life, right? You wanna do it in your own way, but if you can get some advice of, dude, he's obviously done a lot of deals here 
And I've gotten turned down from a lot of deals and I've gotten success from a lot of deals and I understand. And I wish I had someone like that when I was coming up. You know, even the guys that, um, you know, I would say like Chet Thomas, those guys, like I got on Globe and, and, you know, I had a pro shoot with Globe and I was on Dark Star, but Chet was never like, oh yeah, I'm gonna, and he's done a lot of deals by the way, like through his career, but he was never like helping me out and be like, look, it's like, oh, this is how you should negotiate your deal or this or that. I don't think there's anyone out there that really has done this. like. And I don't know if they're scared to share their secrets or if they just, they just, they're too busy. I don't know what it is. And nothing against Chet or anyone well, like that. And there hasn't been a platform that was perfect for it. And there might, yeah, <laughs> and there wasn't a platform that's perfect for it. And I see, you know, and just knowing what I've learned over the last 20 years, and I see there's an opportunity to, to share this with other people and help them become successful at something they love to do. And you're right, it's not just for skateboarders, it could be for snowboarders, it could be for, you could take these strategies that, I've, that I'm presenting um, to, adapt it into your own personal way of going out and being creative to take the passion that you have and turn it into doing something and actually making money doing it. And then, you know, doing what you love for a living. That's the ultimate goal. At the end of the day, figure out what you love to do, learn the strategies and, and, and get good at your craft and then learn the strategies of how to work with brands or how to get creative to make some income doing what you love and then you never feel like you're working a day in your life. Yeah, well, and look at what the ultimate goal is. Where do you wanna Mm -hmm. get? And sometimes financially is like the fastest way to get to that goal, Mm -hmm. but not always, like I paint a lot, right? I accepted a job to paint all these band like names in their like specific fonts, right? right? For For this window before this music festival. Yeah. I knew financially for the amount of time it was gonna take me was not worth my time. Yeah. However, Mm -hmm. I was like, well, I've never really done complicated lettering before. Yeah. I don't have this in my portfolio. I'll do this this one time so that way now I can show that I have done this and I've learned it. I know that for sure I can do this. Yeah. And then in the future, I can pitch for a different dollar amount, right? Yeah. So it's like the, you got to look you at- You got to be time sensitive. You, right, exactly. Uh, what, what, where you put your time and your effort because you know life is short and time flies. I mean, yeah. dude, when I moved to California, I was 19. I'm freaking 39 now. Holy shit, that's crazy yeah. to say. But um, time flies. So yes, you want to be time sensitive and you want to focus your projects on the things that are very- um, that you 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 almost want to write this down too and like you want to write down like what you where where you want to go because you can't do a million things at once you want to focus on the things that really make sense i'm going to go to this too because i was going to do a podcast called dropping in with let's go and it's a lot of work to do a podcast you know this a lot of work to do (laughs) a podcast and i was like man and the way i was going to do it was the way you're doing it right now where i was going to bring in guests to my house Mm. and Dude, this is a lot of work. Multiple cameras. We got editing here. Like, dude, there's a lot of work that goes into this. I got all the equipment and like, um, and then I did a couple episodes. I never came out with them because I didn't have the passion to edit all this. This is a lot of work. Dude, it's to, like it's 20 gnarly. to 40 hours of work. For it's one gnarly. Episode. <laughs> so then I was like, all right, because I, I love talking. I love teaching, you know, and, and coming up with ideas and, and doing yeah. cool shit, you know, and involving my friends. That's ultimately what I was going to do. I was just going to interview and hang out with my friends and, yeah. and, um, and we're gonna get to that because with the with the with the skate community that I'm building, the skate life, and then with the master class in the skate life, I want to bring in uh, on some of these Zoom meetings and actually do some Q and A and and I don't want to say podcast, but could be kind of similar to sure. podcast. Yeah. Bringing in like a, a Dave Pachinski or Manny Santiago or Ryan Desenzo, get their perspective on how they get their sponsors and pick their brain of like, okay, how did you do it coming up as a kid from Canada? This yeah. is how I did it from a kid from Wisconsin. You know, what do you, what's different from back then to now? I think that would be very interesting. And I think that would be really cool for people to to hear. Yeah. So it's not just coming from me, it's coming from other rad skaters that like are out there doing it. Um, so I was gonna do a podcast and then I was like, man, I, I kind of want to do a TV show too. And I was like, man, I, I just don't have the time to do both. Which right. one do I want to do more? And I was like, well, with the TV show, I can skate a little bit in it. I'll do some hosting. So I'll still be able to talk and like hype shit up. And then they'll do the editing. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, sure. I won't have to deal with the editing. And um, and then I can promote like a cool thing. And, I, and then I'm helping people out. Right. And so I put my all my focus in on the next gen TV show. Yeah. So I stopped doing. The, I stopped with that idea of the podcast. But even though I always wanted to do a podcast and it was in the back of my mind, now we're gonna do the podcast in a different kind of way. Yeah. Where now it's gonna be, you know, I, my vision of this is on a on a Zoom call with all these kids that are watching live that right. are just with my friends, like I was gonna do, or bringing in like business owners, maybe like mm-hmm. Tyler from OC Ramps, sure. and asking Tyler, dude, like, what do you look for in in in, in amateur skateboarders, right. or what do you look for, like, you know what I mean? And the kids can actually hear it from the horse, and we just it's live, it's like no cut. And, and we record it and we just throw it up on our on our school platform. And if you miss that episode, you just watch it back. And it, it's 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 different than something like this. Right. But I think it would be really cool for what I'm doing with building a community 
of skateboarders that are like-minded or people that are like-minded that can get some knowledge. The whole the whole idea behind this is um, spreading the knowledge of how how to be successful in something that you love to do. And skateboarding is our passion. And if you're part of the skate life community, you're gonna learn from other people in this community and you're gonna meet people. Yeah. Cause you're gonna meet Jimmy that lives in Ohio or Jimmy's gonna meet Bobby that lives, you know, from Ohio in and Bobby in Florida. And Bobby from Florida is gonna meet Adam that lives in California or right. Adam that or Adam might meet you know, Joe that lives in freaking New Zealand, you yeah. know, like, so you're going to meet like like-minded people and skateboarders that kind of want to make this happen. And maybe Bobby's never been to California. So he met, met Adam and they connected because mm-hmm. it's through the community and now they're chatting and now he's flying out to California. So building community, I think is very important and very cool. And no one has really done this because there wasn't that many platforms in the past to do this. No, there wasn't. So I'm thinking of ways to the closest was forums. Right? Yeah, like forums. Yeah, it's kind of like forums. Something that used to be around for like filmers and yeah. videographers and skateboarding. Yeah, it is. But kind technology of... evolved, and now it's like an. And that's yeah. one thing is is like people get pissed off about and angry, like, oh, this is everyone has to do Instagram now. Everyone has to do blah blah yeah. blah. But really, it's about looking at like, well, okay, you don't love that thing, but there's more opportunity than ever. Yeah. You just have to figure out where is the opportunity. And yeah. with technology, this is one huge opportunity that nobody has tried to take yeah. advantage of. And it's new. It's it's honestly new for me. I've never built a community, you know. But I know I have passion to help others. I know skateboarding, like Sam said, it's very true. It really is a community. Yeah. And I know if I can connect people, I think this is really cool in a, in one place where it's a lot of like minded people. And I have friends that are pro skateboarders that you know that have made it pretty well in the industry. I would say, yeah. and they could share a lot of advice for people too. And I'm sure they want to help out people too because they're they've gotten help through their career. So why sure. wouldn't they want to come on and, and, and give back and help out? Yeah. And then if Especially you want, if you're doing the work and they just have to show up. <laughs> yeah. And we're doing all the work and you know, it costs me a yeah. hundred bucks to be on the school community. So it's yeah. costing me money and my time and I'm doing it for free because yeah. I want to help out people. Now, if you want to learn more and you really want to get engaged on like a next level, like we're going to create a community called the master class, which literally will probably be like 22 bucks or 27 bucks, very cheap. You know, right now yeah. I think I was thinking like 20, maybe five bucks a week. I go on there and I give my time and we really get more in depth. And then if you really have questions and you really want to like sure. work with me one-on-one, which no one really offers that kind of stuff, right. you know, maybe it's 200 bucks or I don't know what it is. You know, right. I, I don't really, I'm not thinking of the price. It's not really, about the money. It's yeah. not, no, no. It's really about building a cool community with like-minded people, giving them really cool knowledge um, from myself and my friends. Yeah. and um a place where people can connect you yeah. know i think that's i think that's super important you know and i and and instagram you can connect with people but on here it's just if you look at the school community it's pretty cool how they have the layout and it's very simple very simple to use which i really like because i'm not like a computer geek where i'm really like i'm not good with technology i guess yeah, you could say sure. so it's, it's a very like simple platform yeah. which which that's what i like because i looked at some of the other platforms are out there like kajabi it was like uh, it, it was just too confu- too much for me you know right. i'm very simple like uh, not over the top like yeah you know i got an iphone and very easy to use i don't have the android or whatever sure, it is yeah, you yeah, know yeah. what i mean like yeah. um i have some skateboard questions for you because i feel cool. like i can't i can't interview you and not talk about skateboarding because we really have left some on the table and you did a nine club episode which was like two hours and <laughs> almost three hours long yeah but there were still some questions they didn't ask yeah cool. what was your favorite uh Mo- skateboard moment that you witnessed not that was a trick of yours but you were at i guess the first thing that comes off the to, off my mind was when lindsey robertson backside 180 off the the deck over the rail at the skate park at tampa off the vert ramp whoa do you remember that no Dude, i mean he, he ollied he was gnarly but bro he ollied it and he back 180 off the vert ramp over the railing at skate park at tampa backside 180 into the street course holy Lindsay Rob- shit zero yeah yeah, yeah no yeah. i remember him. that was like one of those moments he was in the dc video he was yeah. the heel flipper yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i know like he's about. insane he was in the mystery video yeah. um and then the other one i have to say shout out to my boy dave pachinski when he kick flipped del toro you I were there, there. Mm-hmm. Whoa. he went we went to lake forest skate park and there's an eight stair or was it ten stair maybe ten eight or ten i don't know sure and and oh by the way i got a great story about dave um his board was like literally like a 7.5 Super, super small board and like the loosest trucks. I'm literally like- When I, he did El Toro? I, yeah, dude. He like Holy literally kicked up El Toro on the smallest board that was like literally like 7.5. And the yeah. trucks were so loose. It's crazy. And I think one of them, he stuck it and he actually got wheel bite. Um, 
because his trucks were so loose. Right. And I think I gave him wax or someone, or maybe Hoops did the film or gave him wax. I'm like, dude, you got to wax under that wheel well. So like when you get wheel right. bite, it like goes through. And uh, I think he did it like a couple tries later, but he smacked his head pretty hard because he, he got saw, wheel bite. I remember bite. that clip. So those are like the two where I was like, oh, shit it's going down you know what i mean dude <laughs> yeah the yeah. kickflip was gnarly but the back 180 was insane um that was that was bananas dude everyone skated small uh, small boards way back then yeah. i remember i remember the first yeah. time i saw an eight yeah. when i was like 16 and i was like what is that monster yeah. i wrote <laughs> i wrote 7.75 and then went to seven eight and then eight was like a big deal and then like 8.25 was a huge deal to me and that's what i ride now oh sure um yeah, so it's just like, yeah, I mean, I, I upsize. But yeah, I know what you're saying. When you thought of eight, you're like, holy shit, this thing's huge. I and wrote eight and a quarters for the couple of video parts that I have. That yeah. There's like at least one trick that I think you'll think is cool. Okay, and the next thing. What's yeah. the, I know that you've had a lot of injuries, but what's the scariest injury that you've witnessed? Oh, shoot, that I've witnessed. That's a good question. I know my scariest injury was my collarbone. Yeah, my, I my, did when, I, when, I, when I separated my shoulder, I should AC say my, joint. my arm was down to my knee and I did that at the Hollywood high rail. That was, that's the AC joint. Yeah. It Cause was I not, had my shoulder reconstructed ooh. in the same exact way. Yeah. My, I have, I have pictures of where the bones like, yeah. Yeah. It's a nasty it one. Cause good. you get forever sore from that. Shit. Yeah. For, yeah, yeah. To this day. Yep. And that happened when I was like 18 or 19. Now the gnarliest fall that I witnessed, dude. I can't even think of one off the top of my head. I mean, I've, I've seen some gnarly falls for sure, but like nothing that like really came to mind just like that last one, Lindsay. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. If it comes to I guess later. one of the gnarliest ones that I haven't witnessed but was more recent that I thought was crazy was when Sheckler uh, <gasps> broke both of his Dude, ankles yeah. on that hubba. I watched that live. On that hubba, right? Yeah, when they were streaming it live. Yeah, the stream. On, oh, my God, on the, uh, what, what, with, um, What's it called? The live... They don't do it anymore. No. They should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. The app, I can't. Face think. melters. Yeah, 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 yeah. The face I, melters. I watched that, it. That was cool. Yeah, e ETN. He, he kicked out and then the yeah. whole way down into, oh. That, that, yeah, yeah, and then Aiden Campbell still went and like board slid it right after. After, yeah, which yeah. is crazy. <sighs> but yeah, that was probably one of the gnarliest slams that like I wasn't there, but right. that I witnessed that, you know, that was like, holy shit checks like that was <laughs> for real <laughs> dude yeah he's a he's a beast for getting back yeah, up okay dude. so you tried hollywood high kickflip back lip and then nigel went and got that one no, what no, hang on hang on <laughs> i tried kickflip back lip the hollywood high rail but before that i tried kickflip back lip in the wilshire rail oh the 15 and he went and did that one i got service i i locked in perfect <laughs> And then slid all the way down. I ran back up the stairs and missed my catch at the very top of the rail oh. and got service. My elbow's still swollen. To oh, like, God. <laughs> like, still swell bow. That was like 10 years ago. Still got like got permanent you. swell bow. So he kicked foot back lip the 15. That became a cover. Then I tried to kick foot back lip the, the Wilshire 15. That was a yeah. cover of his. So I was like, he got that one. So I went to the Hollywood rail to try to do there. And I got service there. And then he ended up kick foot back lipping that one too. So two rails, Nigel, <laughs> not just one. <laughs> Dude. And yeah. think about the iconic front side flip yeah. that Reynolds did over the rail. Yeah, that was That could have been you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah. other than that, what's a trick that you wanted to get that somebody else got to it first? That I just told you. All right. Because I would have, because I would have went back to do the kick foot back lip. Because at that time, that was yeah. like my trick, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Actually, now thinking about it, I wanted a 270 lip, the 16 2, and oh. Deshaun Jordan went and did it. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess th there you go. So Deshaun Jordan, but shout out here. I mean, these guys are amazing skateboarders, and like sure. I'm friends with these guys, and they're, yeah. they're like, Deshaun's awesome, dude. Like, I love their skateboarding, and I'm right. super stoked for them. So I'm not like, any yeah, bitterness. no shade, but no. it's just, you know, coming But there, that is a trick that I was like, I bet you I can. Well, up. I did it down the 12 in the almost video. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I bet you I can do it on the 16. And then he did it. Well, that's one of the things, though, in the Midwest that was so cool when we were filming our shop videos was like yeah. nobody had done anything. Like whatever tricks we were doing, we knew were NBDs yeah. at those spots. Yeah. You go to well, California, everything gets ripped. <laughs> that's why I'd come back here to film. <laughs> yeah, no, right. A lot of my, even almost round three, like I nolly flip board the 10 stair, the Sherman rail on yeah. the north side here and uh, in Milwaukee. And no one's really skated that rail. You sure. know what I mean? So like yeah. back tail the green machine out there and like Delafield or somewhere, Beloit or somewhere. I, I forget sure, where it is, yeah, but yeah. no one skated that rail. The Walkshaw rail, the little Walkshaw rail where I picky flip, switch back lip. Dang. And that the last trick in the Globe video, that was out here. So like, I really enjoyed to come back to the Midwest and skate out here and skate spots. Plus, plus those spots, a lot of people that watch the videos are like, dude, they hit me up like other skaters. Like, where's that spot? I'm like, not around here. <laughs> not, <laughs> no one's going to- Not in California. <laughs> no one's going to bite your <laughs> yeah. Okay, if you could have a guest model on any company right now, like something that's current that's out, which one would you pick? Well, let's go back to something because I had a guest model on Crooked, which that was like, like, 
But it was kind of official. Like at it the was time. kind of official. I called it. Yeah, I guess it was kind of official. I called a guest model because there was only like 110 made of one of them. Sure. And then maybe 120 made of the other one. But I called a guest model. But yeah, I guess yeah. I was on Crooked. But that was like kind of a dream to have Gons do some artwork for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, if I could have a guest model, um, dude, I'll have to go with... Uh, well, there's two really cool brands that I really like. I like Al Partnin's new brand, Space Pupil, because yeah. people Pupil is all about like bringing up people. Pupil is all about people uplifting people in life, yeah. and it's always been that way from like day one when he lived here in Milwaukee. So I was really stoked to see him bring back the Pupil brand, and now he's got Lizard King and those guys on it. So Al, you got to give me a guest board on that brand, brother. <laughs> Dude, that <laughs> and would be uh, dope. and we'll bring it back to like like some OG like real cool stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know, like I, I I'm a, I'm a big fan of like what Shane O'Neill's brand is April. I think that's a really cool brand. I'm, sure. I'm a fan of what Paul does too with Primitive. Those are cool brands, but Pupil is like the real, the real deal. Like the OG. Like yeah. I'm so stoked to see Al bring that that company back to life. Yeah, you know? dude. And, and well, really, or make it. I I shouldn't say bring it back to life. Bring Pupil to life yeah. more than just what he was doing here in Wisconsin. You yeah, because there were like contests yeah. and stuff before, right? Yeah, now it's like full board brand. He's got an amazing team that he's building with Lizard King and sure. all these upcoming guys, which is uh, which is phenomenal. If you could pick any, um, let's say for a King of the Road, if you could pick mm. any four guys to go on King of the Road as your team, which four guys would you pick? <laughs> I would pick Shane O'Neill because he he's can one do of my. Everything. He can do everything. <laughs> um, I would pick Tom Penny because he's one of my favorite skaters of all time. Shane O'Neill, Tom Penny. I would pick Daywan because I really enjoyed skating with Daywan on almost, and we actually went on King of the Road together. Oh, and that was the one yeah. of the that was with Sheckler when he was mm -hmm. like really little, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I did that watch was, that. That was, that was a, a long time. That was ago. a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we came through the Midwest too. That was the early King of the Road days. Yeah, we went yeah. through the Midwest too. We went to uh, Milwaukee, Chicago, and Minneapolis, which was cool. And then the fourth would be, um, who would I bring, man? As the fourth guy, I would bring my filmer Hoops because like he's filmed all my stuff and like he's just a riot to be on tour with, and he gets along with all those dudes other than. I think Penny that that because I don't think Tom's ever filmed with hoops, but um, and he owes you for losing your Toyota deal, and he does owe <laughs> me. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. Okay, who's the most underrated pro skateboarder? Oh uh, man, underrated. You know who I used to think was super underrated over all the years was uh, Cody McIntyre. Yeah, yeah, dude, and he was in that digital video when he yeah. he what did he do? Nolly big heel down uh, yeah. uh, Carlsbad. Yeah, Cody McIntyre is a beast, yeah. man. He's he's crazy good skateboarder, and I I I've, man, I, I've skated mini ramp with him. He's insane on that. He skates yeah. street. He's in, he's all around a, an insanely good skateboarder. And he's doing his own thing with his own brand now these yeah. days too. But I feel like he's kind of underrated, you know. And yeah. he, he does his thing in Texas and stuff, and yeah. it's really cool to see what he's doing for sure. Yeah. But I'm like, man, this guy, dude, he's he's gnarly. Yeah, you know he should have I mean? been a lot more famous than he was. What's the yeah. Most, what is the worst famous skate spot? One that like you you uh, saw in videos you thought would be good and it just sucked. Uh, shoot. Worst famous. In California, there's they're they're like they're, these spots are pretty perfect. I feel. Yeah. Or or I guess because I'm from the Midwest, where it's like it's crusty ground out here and there's like right. cracks and it's like go skate the Marquette Hubba. You go look at that thing. And you're like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Even now I go look at it. I'm like, how did I not only no slide this thing? Um. But yeah, I'd go to like the Beverly Hills rail and it's like perfect. Hollywood was pretty perfect. I mean, all these spots in California were pretty perfect. Um, what was a gnarly spot that I've skated? Um, I just feel like the ground out there is so much nice. Like we grew up in the Midwest where the ground there's is- no salt out there. Yeah. trash out here, right, you know yeah. what I mean? So like we grew up in skating really rough ground. Yeah. So like out there, you go out there and it's all smooth and perfect. So I'd never really thought of like, oh, this spot's kind of too chunky to skate. I always just kind of made it work, sure. I guess. I guess it'd be like kind of a random spot, maybe not even a famous spot. Cause a lot of those famous spots that you see, they're pretty, they're pretty perfect, I would think. Sure. Maybe Wallenberg was pretty gnarly. Like, you know, like Wallenberg was pretty, insane like i've never done anything down wallenberg but just looking at it like yeah. that's a famous dude spot. if you need to take a roll into it just to like get yeah across i would it. say wallenberg out of yeah. all of them would be wallenberg because like i went there and i didn't skate it and it was like gnarlier than i i like the, the tricks that, that have gone down there is pretty insane that's another one you should have front side flip before reynolds and reynolds is yeah. like my favorite skateboarder of all time so yeah, i'm not knocking him i'm just saying yeah. at yeah. the time i feel like you could have front side flipped it as well yeah okay now going back to like outside of those ones because i was just curious of that um 
we talked about like techniques that trigger your brain mm -hmm. into things such as like manifestation and, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. And I told you about that book, um, the way of the peaceful warrior where it, you can like visualize a stoplight that helps you. What are some of the techniques that you do use that help trigger your brain to be successful in the things that you're trying? Um, well, when skating, I do a lot of like, um, like what Penny used to do back in the day, you kind of see him do it like where he spins the four wheels. And I kind of do that three times, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, boom. And then go to do the trick. Like you won't really see me do it on camera, but I do it. You know, sure. like Paul Rodriguez back in the day would like be it like before he skated contests or like before his running, he'd kind of take his hat and like go like this, kind of look down. I didn't know if he was like praying or what he was, you know, but, but like, I think just every skater kind of has their own form of how they get in the zone. Yeah. Um, I would think the one that where I do with my wheels and that's, I was doing that way before I met with George Pratt, by the way. Sure. And then I think the light switch, like if I'm really having a hard time, I'm like, oh man, like I want to get this trick, like one, two, like three, like this one, you know, it's just like something just triggers me to, to get it that one, you know what I mean? Why do you think that works? I don't know, man. I think skateboarding is like half, like you get to a certain point I think it, it becomes more mental game than, than, you know, like I know how to do a kickflip back lip or frontside flip. And then I go do it and I'm like kicking away and I'm kicking away and I'm, you know what I mean? I yeah. think it's just more of a met, you get to a point and some of these tricks that you know how to do and you've done them so many times that it's, it's not even like the trick anymore. It's the mental game. Yeah. And I think just that one, two, like three, this is it. It's like telling your mind, like, this is the one like hoops would always, um, you know, when we were filming, like, be like, I'm calling the cops. I'm sure. calling the cops, dude. Like, when the cops would show up, come around the corner, I would land at that one every time. Like, I did 180 nose grind revert in the globe video down a handrail, and, like, the cop came around the corner, I landed at that one. I was sitting there trying it for three hours. Sure. And then, like, at the contest, like, Duncan would be on the mic, like, all right, 30 seconds left. Da -da -da. You know, it's like, boom, I'd lock, lock down, like, three or four, like, the gnarliest tricks I've ever done. And, you know what I mean? The sure. contest, like, that, like something just triggers the mind to land those tricks at that time. And I think certain techniques of, you know, spinning my wheels three times and like telling myself like, this is the one or three swipes up or like how Paul like grabs his hat and kind of gets in his zone. Yeah. I think it just kind of like you reinsure or Andrew touches like the wall three times, yeah, yeah. like kind of what he says. Uh, I think those are just like techniques that people naturally, use. everyone has their own, you know, but right. that's kind of what I do with, with skateboarding. Do you do anything outside of skateboarding? Like say if you have a meeting mm -hmm. that you like need to nail, Right. Is there like, do you meditate ahead of time on how you expect the meeting or how you want the meeting to go? Do you visualize it in any kind of way or anything like that? I, I do write down a lot of like my, like what I want to do. Okay. Like I wouldn't even almost say, say like goals, but kind of like goals are like what I want to do and like what I'm going to accomplish next. I write down in like a book. Sure. Like I write down what I want to do. Like I, I have a, like, like I really feel like when you write down what you want, it's like comes more to life when you write it down. Yeah, yeah. Like it means something more, like with a pen, not like in your text or in your phone, like literally writing it down in like a book. You know right. what I mean? Like, but I mean, it's the same way of like verbalizing something. Yeah. Once you finally say yeah. it out loud in front of your friend or whatever, you're like, I pray oh, too. Now I have to Actually, do I do it. pray because you know I mean? I'll go in the sauna and like I'll I'll like like pray sometimes. Just say you know like very great. Like I'll like you know God, please forgive me for my sins and yeah. like I'm very grateful for everything I have and where I'm going and we're going in a good direction and like bring this into my life and and um and i'll also use like the universe i'll say and work with the universe to like attract this into my life yeah and i'll do like a meditation kind of in there and i'll do like certain techniques like that george pratt has taught me like the tapping on the side of the temples and i do this a lot of times in my sauna sure i go in my sauna and i like meditate and i pray and i do the tapping techniques and i do certain techniques to really get me uh, in the zone of like building this reality that I don't have yet, but it's, it's like being brought into my life. Do you have, is there a resource where somebody can find some of those? Cause I'm just curious. And um, trying some of them. You might be able to see the thing is like George Pratt, he's a bit older. He's like, you can YouTube him and you can see him on yeah. Larry King and maybe you can see some interviews of him, but he's kind of like, this is crazy to say, like, he's the real deal of like, he really helped me so much, but I, he's not like a, a like a like someone that he, like overly like he promotes is what he does. He's like Rick Rubin. That's, it makes me think of Rick Rubin in like, a way of like he doesn't like that's promote. not just out. Yeah, it's yeah. not like he's putting out lessons on the internet. And he doesn't care to. It's not right. like that. Yeah. You know, I think it's you know I got like I only reason why I know of him. I don't know how Rob found him was because of Rob was like I was going through this and I found this like hypnotist and duty like changed my life completely. I was like yeah. whoa like he's speaking like similar to like where I'm at. Yeah. Like I, I'm gonna go check this guy out. You right. know what I mean. 
And then I realized like, whoa, dude, this dude's pretty powerful. And I, I went to him, I don't know, like six months later after the first time I went to him, not even to do another session, but sure. I seen the success I had just in six months. I went down there and I like personally went down to San Diego and thanked him and like shook his hand and signed him another skateboard and said, dude, this, this is really like, you did a number on me, bro. Like this is insane. Sure. You know, and he's older. I don't know how much long, like, I think this is a passion for him, like more than anything, but it's not like he's a hypnotist at at some random place. Like he's at the hospital right? at the Scripps, I think it's Scripps hospital. Maybe I'm not saying it right. Scripps hospital and hospital in San Diego. So when I showed up there, I'm like, look at the address. I'm like, this don't look right. This is the hospital. This is like where people get surgery. Like this, this can't be right. So I called her. She's like, no, Greg, we're in the hospital, like at the 17th floor. So what he is, is he's kind of like a psychiatrist or is, I don't don't know how to explain him. A life coach, kind of psychiatrist, kind of life coach almost. Yeah. But he does use like, like hypnosis, hypnosis techniques to really change the way you use your mind. Sure. And the way you use your mind and you put these, um, you know, these into, you know, using them every day of your life, you see dramatic change. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's hard, it's hard to explain it. Sure. Unless you've been through it. Yeah, but I think even just like being intentional with like manifestation is is a a thing of like, if you know where you want to go, then Mm -hmm. every little decision that you have to make, each time you think of it and go, does this, whichever decision I'm making, yeah. does this help me get to that point? Yeah. Obviously, I need to make a lot of them, but yeah. if you're just knowing like, that's where you want to go, you can be more intentional with each of those steps al- along the way and it helps you. Yeah, get I think I think what I can say out there, because not everyone's going to be able to go to George Pratt right. listening to this, right? Yeah. But what I can say that I can relate the most to uh, would be The Secret. So there's a book called The Secret, and then there's a movie called The Secret, and I'm terrible at reading. <laughs> so watch a movie. Right? Actually, I'm decent at reading now, but yeah, you know, sure. yeah. for years I was just like, I don't want to read unless it's really something. So like, I watch the movie, and I visualize better, and the way the movie's like done, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and I actually just bought my parents it the other day because I was like, Mom, you'd probably like this a lot, and I'm gonna get her to come to George Pratt too. Just like, sure. you know, I think she's gonna see a lot of change and success, and just I don't know. I think it's just good. For yeah, everyone yeah. to practice manifestation yeah. and visualizing their their thoughts and their future and where they want to go, goal setting, you know. So, yeah. um, but the secret is really cool because uh, you can watch that and you can get a good feeling of what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and that's probably the cheapest, best way to like really fill it out. <laughs> yeah. And there was actually there was actually um, there was actually a, a podcast that came out recently with Rob Deerdick, and he was talking about like he was kind of going through a weird moment too again you know yeah. like later on after he's already kind of had a lot of success but it, it, there's no like in life it always has ups and downs you know it's never going to be just smooth sailing yeah and i think his he said his wife said like let's sit down and just watch the secret yeah let's like re-watch the secret tonight or something and he's like and it brought him back into that like that zen of like okay yeah and then i think it helped him out too so yeah. the secret's really good um that's probably the best thing that i could say that really you could relate that to. I think you have to like constantly mm-hmm. like it's have a lot. reflection and remind yourself of the uh, lessons that you learned or to kind mm-hmm. of stay on track. I got one more question for you because I know again like taking yeah. a lot of time which I'm stoked that yeah, we have to talk cool. for talk to talk yeah. for this long. Yeah, this I cool. ask this question on every episode. I think when you do something that you're passionate about for a living, you get mm-hmm. to have a lot of really unique experiences mm-hmm. and they're rarely financially driven, but it, it's what makes doing all the work worth it. Yep. Can you share a unique experience that happened to you that you're really grateful for? Oh man, I'm so grateful for like every moment throughout my life in my career and the people I've met along the way, you know? I'm mm-hmm. I'm more grateful um for the people I've met along the way that's given me the opportunity. You know sure. what I mean? Like that like meeting Al Partnin in the beginning was huge for me, you know, like to get to California, which was that that was a huge dream of mine. Um and to be able to skate all the spots I looked up to like Reynolds and these guys in the 401 videos. Uh, that was amazing. And then Al kind of introduced me to like Joe Krolik and Chris Ortiz and got me in a trans world and then got me into four one, the video that I was like looking up to and then got me introduced to Bill Weiss and then Bill Weiss got me in the digital video and then got seen by Rodney Mullen that got me into almost. And then from there I got onto globe and then, you know, it's just like all these people I've met along the way. That's, that's what I'm very grateful of and them teaching me life lessons along the way without even me realizing it. I think at a young sure. age, you know what I mean? So yeah. now looking back, I realize it because I'm like, oh my gosh, if Chet wouldn't have told me that back then, you know, but I wasn't thinking that way. I was like, Escort, what? I, I don't know. Right. Yeah, we'll open it up. Yeah, dad, we got to open up Escort. I don't know, Chet's talking about this Escort thing. I don't sure. know, the company's got to pay it or something. I don't know how it works. Right. And then my dad talked to Chet and he's like, this is how it works. And then he's gonna have write-offs and, you know, and then I learned more about it as time went along. 
but I don't think it without those kind of people in my life, I would be where I'm at. Yeah. Well, I think that's why it's so important to be intentional with who you surround yourself by, right? Surround yourself with people that inspire you. Yeah. And it'll make the the world a difference. Yeah. I mean, and do, and do right in your, in your, in your life, you know, do good for other people and do good for yourself and do positive things and do the right things in life. I think you just, I think karma is a big thing. You know, if you do good for yourself and for other people and you're legitimately like a good person, like good things will happen to you, you know, and you want to help out other people and it's, you know, uh, but if you're stealing and you're doing crazy shit, I think you're going to go down a bad road, just bad karma and bad juju and bad energy. Yeah. All that energy is not going to be good for your reality of your future. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be uh, not a good look, you know, but if yeah. you're constantly trying to help people out and you're trying to intentionally do good things for yourself and for other people, um, I think the universe listens to that and it, it, it pays back people tenfold on that dude of, it always you know, comes back to you you don't know yeah. how or why yeah. but it does yeah. somebody that you were nice to said something nice to this other person who said mm. something nice to this person yeah. that then when you happen to be coming through was in a position to do you a, a solid yeah. and you never even knew about yeah. it it's like that and yeah. that happens all the time well yeah dude. and i think i and i think i think um you know it feels that's that's a really good feeling when you help yeah. people out like that's a good feeling and you like that there's like money can't buy that <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. like when you feel good because you've helped other people out or you feel good because you had a goal and you created that goal and you actually achieve that goal and you want to build more and you're you're achieving more goals that you made for yourself that feeling is like is like um, it's it, it's it's amazing you know yeah. and that's like skateboarding it's like having a goal to learn how to do a kickflip front board down a handrail yeah. and you went there five six ten times to the same spot and you finally landed that kickflip front board and you rolled away and you're looking back you're like oh man that felt good you know what i mean yeah. like it's like that accomplishment just feels good and if you can live your life by that and and set goals for yourself and help others along the way i think you're gonna live a very like um you have a very grateful life Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.